I recently sat surrounded by 20 anti-vaxxers on a big platform to debate vaccines for three hours. What I learned very clearly from these encounters is that these people have had interactions with healthcare that were terrible. They've seen bad things happen, that if you just live their life and were exposed only to their anecdotes, you'd also be vaccine skeptical. The 2025 STAT Summit just wrapped up here in Boston. Every fall, STAT's flagship summit brings together the most influential leaders in health and medicine for two days of discussions and two evenings of networking over little hors d'oeuvres and cucumber margaritas. I like to call it Statapalooza. Family medicine physician and YouTube sensation, Dr. Mike, uh, joined me on stage to discuss the importance of communicating trustworthy health information in this particular era. Let's check it out. You know, people have been increasingly turning to content creators like yourself uh, for their information. Um, you've been succe as successful at making sure trustworthy science-based information cuts through the noise on social media uh, as anyone. How do you do it? I think I realized that there was a gap, and that gap was we were doing great research, there were great doctors that are taking care of patients, but the messages weren't landing in part of the healthcare system that most people deemed not part of the healthcare system. You know, being a family medicine doctor, I'm trained to be there for my patients, whether it's in the ER, inpatient setting, nursing home, we even do home visits. But then I realized we weren't there on social media. And because we weren't there, there was uh, a lack of evidence-based voices online, it created this gap that was filled by grifters, by snake oils people, people who were selling all sorts of miracle cures. And we weren't there to combat that. I actually wrote about that in 2017, before the pandemic, warning people that this is gonna be an issue. Three years later, we're facing the pandemic, not enough doctors to fact check the immense amount of misinformation and disinformation being thrown at people. And as a result, people were confused, People were making bad decisions, and the CDC, the FDA, all these large agencies were playing catch up because they had no presence on these platforms. And honestly, the most watched videos on the number one video website in the world, which is YouTube, were mine. And that's sad <laughs> because it should be brilliant researchers, it should be brilliant scientists, but because they didn't invest in those tools, in learning about the platforms, in learning how to communicate to millions, huge missed opportunity. And to that point, um, you know, the public seems to be increasingly skeptical about our health institutions. Um, you know, are there lessons that can be learned from successful con content creators like yourself, uh, particularly when it comes to authenticity and trust? Yeah, I think we've lost trust in the healthcare system for a myriad of reasons. One of the big ones being our craving for certainty and feeling that we needed to be certain in order to win over authenticity. If we go back to 2021 when we're making recommendations about the COVID booster as an example, instead of putting out uh, a very honest message of here are the high risk groups who would most benefit, uh, here's who may not need the vaccine, we said everyone should get it. And the audience felt that they were being tricked, they were being misled because doctors were trying to resort back to this paternalistic approach of we'll tell you what's good for you, just listen to us, you are not the expert, we are. And by taking that approach, long term, we've lost trust. People don't know what to believe. They start following all sorts of echo chambers on social media, and as a result, fall victim to misinformation. Doctors are finding it more difficult to talk to their patients in exam rooms, on television. And now, when we want to counter something that's coming out from even our current administration, we don't have any tools to do it. You know, 20 years ago, <clears throat> if there was a bit of misinformation, it was easy to do a sit-down interview with the leading news station or, or 60 Minutes and counter that narrative. Now where do they go? Uh, I want there to be the place for them to be able to come on my platform, have that conversation, or for me to be that voice to be able to fact check that. And, and speaking of COVID, um, you know, you had already had a, a your YouTube channel for a few years when the pandemic hit. Do you think like the pandemic fundamentally changed or kind of broke the pro how the public kind of pro processes health information? I think it threw gasoline on the fire because people were already using social media to answer their health questions. If we're being honest, like show of hands, first time you have a symptom or first time you get a diagnosis, is the phone the first thing you look at? <laughs> I mean, that's natural. And that was happening in 2017. It's why I started YouTube. And when the pandemic came, and there was so few answers, even if those answers were incomplete, coming from the legit agencies, people craved those answers and they got them.
but they got them from those grifters that I mentioned earlier. And as a result, those people were misled. Those grifters ended up getting massive platforms. They learned how to make use of social media and how to use confrontation, all of these skill sets that marketers have to influence people, while we all raised our noses in the healthcare community and said, we're above this. Good scientists, good doctors do research or they treat patients. They don't spend time looking good on camera or getting pretty lights. But that was a missed opportunity because a big part of healthcare is making sure you're closing that loop and making sure your message lands. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about your process a bit. You're pretty prolific on YouTube. You put out a lot of videos. Um, what, like, how do you come up with your video ideas, what, what you're going to cover? This is the biggest struggle because we're going on year eight of making content and we've been publishing two videos a week uh, at a consistent rate that entire time. We don't want to sensationalize content. We want to always keep medical integrity at the top of our moral compass. But the reality is it's hard. You have to make content about your personal life. You have to bring your dogs into it, your hobbies. And some people might laugh at that or say, perhaps it's unprofessional for a physician to do these things. And I sort of get it because when I first started, I got a lot of side eye from physicians who said, what do you mean you're going to start a social media platform for healthcare? There was a lot of doctors at the time who were making content, uh, perhaps in traditional media, with subjects like, how does your zodiac sign impact your heart health? That was a legit segment on ABC. <laughs> and they viewed me with this skeptical lens, and I understood why. But I said, there's a way to get a lot of people's attention here and then redirect that attention to something valuable. So when I make, even to this day, content laughing at medical memes or reacting to TikToks, people say, but Dr. Mike, we're in a healthcare crisis. You can influence so many people. Why are you choosing to make comedic content right now? Well, guess what? When that comedic content reaches viewership of 5, 10, 15 million, that video is now in that user's watch history, which means when I make my next video discussing the press conference linking Tylenol to autism, my video by the algorithm will be served to that person. Had I not made that silly video, they would be completely unaware of the fact that there was misinformation being shared with them at the highest levels. So there's a tremendous amount of strategy that goes into figuring out cadence, style of video, accuracy of content, but at the same time, studying. What do these experts, quote unquote experts, do so well to trick people into watching their content? They make content relatable. They remove scientific lingo. They use really good quality thumbnails, titling that's captivating. So we learn and study what everyone else is doing well, but we bring it to go to bat for evidence-based medicine. Uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said that uh, Americans are being alg algorithmically polarized, sorry, that's a mouthful, <laughs> uh, by social media. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think it's affecting how uh, people access information about health? Oh, for sure. I mean, this is happening on social media, but it even happens within our AIs. You look at ChatGPT, you ask the same question. It depends whose chat you're using. Uh, it, your answer will be drastically different. Um, what I think is happening, that's at least the most under our control, because I like to think about all these situations as practically as possible. Perhaps that's the family medicine doctor in me, um, is are they being algorithmically polarized because the algorithm is bad or because one group of people has learned to use the algorithm to their advantage so well and we're falling behind. I think that's a big part of it. I don't think that there are enough people who understand what the algorithm is, how social media works. Um, I look at a recent example where Secretary Kennedy essentially def defamed the entire medical profession and went on a podcast and said all doctors are just in it for the profit, and uh, they're, they're aiming to keep their patients sick. I mean, something that would immediately lose someone's position at any corporate job in America, at least I like to think so. But he says this, and the AMA, which is the uh, group that supposedly stands up for the physicians in America, issues a strongly worded tweet <laughs> that reaches 5,000 people on, on their X, or they get the president of the AMA to sit in front of a webcam with terrible audio, the screen reflecting in the glasses with no lighting, to also make a response video reading a script from a screen. 
It just shows, like if, if you show those to people side by side, Secretary Kennedy sitting relaxed, great atmosphere, perfect video content in comparison to this really robotic speech, and you don't even know what the substance of what they're saying is. You trust Secretary Kennedy over President Mukamala. So I think we need to understand that it's not about putting on fancy outfits. It's about being presentable, realizing that fancy cameras are no longer just for the top tier studios in Hollywood. You can get an amazing set for a couple thousand bucks. And I know how much the AMA fees are every year, and I know they can afford that. <laughs> Um, so, so it, it's that point. Like, how do you think medical institutions themselves should be thinking differently about reaching people more directly versus social, with, with social media? Um, I think they need to study the algorithms. I think they need to understand what works on each platform. Um, they have to hire individuals who are users of those platforms. One of my biggest strengths and why I think we have so much success is because I spend a lot of time scrolling. Perhaps these days it's doom scrolling, but I scroll a lot. Not because I love social media and it's so engaging to me. I watch it as an educated consumer. I see what works. I see what's getting people's attention. I see how people's behavior shifts between likes and comments and how it works distribution-wise on each platform. Understanding that when a YouTube video is made, someone actually has to click and choose to watch it versus on TikTok, it's passively fed to them. How does that impact someone's behavior? How should that impact how I present my information? So you have to think about all of this as a starting point. And from there, you will gradually become more uh, adept at making content go viral, having it uh, land to more and more people. Because user-generated content succeeds from people enjoying it, liking it, and while that is annoying for us in the healthcare space, because no one really wants to sit through a science lecture, there is a way to make science enjoyable and make it not seem boring. And I think we have to invest in that. Yeah. And so many people nowadays get their, you know, their not videos, it's not, often not sitting through a 10, 15 minute video. Sometimes it's a TikTok or a YouTube short, those can be 60, 90 seconds, but often medical topics are important, like you can't, really cannot get through in that short amount of time. So I was kind of curious of how you think about um, you know, accuracy versus brevity on these platforms. It's tough. Um, some content cannot be put into a short. Like you, you want to, uh, you have to, if, if you really want to, you would have to create some sort of piece of content that encourages people so much to go watch the lengthy video. But you can't really talk about it in depth. At the same time, with that Tylenol video, the video that I posted on YouTube was about 12 minutes in length. Um, and in order to put that same video, or I refilmed a few sections of it, for short form content, I had to be really careful. What information am I gonna choose to omit? What information is very valuable? What information is gonna make people keep watching for the first few seconds, which will tell the algorithm to show this to more and more people? Because ultimately, if after the first second people swipe away, it doesn't matter how effective my messaging is because no one's gonna see it. That is one of the craziest things that I find about social media. I can make the most amazing YouTube video in the world, but if I make a terrible thumbnail or a terrible title that doesn't perhaps match what's in the video, no one's gonna see it even though I have 14 million subscribers. And when I say no one, it might get a few 10,000 views here and there because of the following. But big picture, if you want to reach millions of people and go past your subscribers, past what your initial set of uh, audience that you want to reach, you have to think about how engaging, how relatable, how entertaining your medical and science content is. And that's very unusual for us. We're not trained in that way in the healthcare sphere. Yeah. What do you think the future looks like for people who value providing accurate and authoritative health in um, science communication? It's so hard to say. I think that the future is bright. I, I, I was at uh, Harvard last week speaking to students, and I saw that they had a class specifically made for this, meaning dense scientific communication, understanding how to make it relatable, learning what works, studying, watching back footage. One of their assignments before I came up was to watch a podcast that I did with a doctor, Elizabeth Potter, who recently challenged uh, United Healthcare and write what worked, what didn't work about the interview. That is how you learn. And 
before in my healthcare education, that was never, there was never any emphasis put on that. There was no uh, value placed on the doctors that were communicating best with their patients. It was always who got the best scores, who is the bright student in the class. But more and more what I realized was it was the best communicators that knew the information solid, but the best communicators were the ones that were having the most clinical success. And I feel like now that situation is basically on steroids where the best communicators are not just great in the clinic, but they're also very valuable in the social media landscape. So I hope these future bright minds of Harvard and other institutions can lead the way in this regard. And, and we're almost at time, um, but there's a lot of people in this room that, have, uh, whether they're in academia or they're research institutions or, or industry, um, that have an interest in communicating accurate, uh, authoritative health and science information to the public. And if you could just leave um, people here with one last takeaway about like what, what you think, the, uh, uh, how to be most effective at that, what, what would that be? I think the message there is think human first. And that message has really resonated with me and done wonders for my career, whether I was treating a patient in my exam room or I was thinking about what content I should make or how I should open a video. I think about what a human would do, not what the science shows or what the data shows. What does the human want to hear? And a lot of times, especially when you're having a debate with people who disagree with you, I recently sat surrounded by 20 anti-vaxxers on a big platform to debate vaccines for three hours. What I learned very clearly from these encounters is that these people have had interactions with healthcare that were terrible. They've seen bad things happen, that if you just live their life and were exposed only to their anecdotes, you'd also be vaccine skeptical. So what I realized is a lot of content, a lot of messaging needs to be thought through a human first lens, which could mean validating people's beliefs, Validating people's misbeliefs, saying that it's okay to misbelieve something and uh, allow them space to be wrong. Allow space for yourself to be wrong, which means taking chances. Uh, these days with short form content, it's easier than ever to start making content of wide variety of content and just seeing what works. Allow the algorithm to figure out what works and was, what is most successful and guide you in that process. Dr. Mike, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again to Dr. Mike. That panel was a lot of fun. And I, I just want to give a huge shout out to the Stats Event team. These summits are a lot of work and you all crush it every year. Uh, I've been to all the summits and I think this was genuinely probably the best one yet. I already miss all my Stat colleagues who came in from all over the country for Statapalooza. And I'm already counting the days until Stat Karaoke next year. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It's a little click, but it's a big deal for us. Uh, we don't have 14.4 million subscribers like Dr. Mike, but I would like to like close that gap just a little bit. And we'll be back next week with a video about what rollerblades, dumpsters, and Ozempic have in common.